Uh, good, morning. good morning. So my, my name's Dave, uh, um, and I teach at Western Seminary. So that's uh, the main campus is in Portland, but we have two campuses in Northern California, so I teach at both of them, Sacramento and then the Bay Area. I'm primarily a New Testament specialist, uh, but I also uh, did graduate work in Roman social history. Very exciting, very exciting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, published in both. And um, I think, you know, I think I need to take a little a moment, though, uh, apart from the sermon. To, to, uh, so two weeks ago, I was driving on Auburn Folsom Road at 8 in the morning, Sunday morning, so I was going to preach in Folsom. And right, just right at, a little after 8, and that's a, that's a busy road, right? The speed limit is 55 each way. And uh, just a little after 8, a car coming the other way, lost control, crossed the median, and hit me head on. So actually he was, apparently he was actually in the air and uh, his car was turning and hit my, the front of my Jeep and crushed the, anyway. Uh, and then, then somebody else was behind me that then ran, in, ran into me. So four people, three cars all totaled and everybody walked away. So that's all, thank you, thank you. Yeah, just thankful to God for that and I have... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't look like I'm injured. Uh, so I'm, I'm, so I've got there's something wrong with my knee still, and, but, and uh, I'm more aware of the inside, like what's directly under my skin than usual. A lot of soreness. But anyway, just thought you ought to know that. So thank you, and thanks for, pray for the, for the other folks. Um, apparently, if you're driving at 8 in the morning on Sunday, it's pretty clear you've got something to do with church, because the other people that got hit were also going to church, so... So anyway, okay, so uh, today, teaching of Jesus. So I, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to be here this week and then not next week or the week after that. So what could, I, what could I do that might be helpful? And I thought big, so I thought big picture. So understanding Jesus, there are three main themes. Let's go, to, oh, I have, I have it. <laughs> See, I shouldn't be trusted with this. Can you just do it? Yeah, because that's better. <laughs> Yeah, three main, thank you. Three main themes dominate the teaching of Jesus. Son of man, kingdom of God, and discipleship. So between these, and these are, these are interpenetrating, they are, they are, they are interrelated. And uh, if you, if, so if you have this in your head, you got about 85, 90% of everything Jesus taught. So this is, the, this is the, this is big picture. These three themes are terrifically important. Next slide. So, Son of Man. Uh, you may have noticed that Jesus in the Gospels never calls himself Messiah. That's never a self-reference he uses. He never says, I am the Messiah. People call him the Messiah, and he agrees. He knows he is, so he's not disputing that. But um, he chooses Son of Man as his own self-reference. 82 times in the Gospels. That's pretty intriguing. So he knows he's the Messiah, but he doesn't call himself that. He chooses something else instead. Next slide. Um, and the, uh, the, that's helpful, the Greek, hachwios to anthropo. So it's his favorite self-designation, and it's almost exclusively on the lips of Jesus. So not only is he, does he call himself that uh, habitually, but almost nobody else ever calls him that. In fact, every once in a while, people say, what are you talking about? I mean, who is this son of man? And then the phrase dies out after the Gospels. So if you're a real critical kind of person, that's evidence that this is actually historically accurate. Jesus actually called himself this. Because there'd be no reason later on for people to invent it, because the phrase dies out after the Gospels. Next slide. So there are three questions. I mean, this is pretty intriguing. Are you intrigued? Does this sound, are you like excited now? Like the previews are over, now the movie's starting, and... Uh, so the uh, three questions that are, that are conjured by this phenomenon. Why, you know, why didn't he call himself Messiah? So what's that deal? Why didn't he call himself that? And okay, since he didn't call himself that, he had to call himself something else. Why did he choose son of man? Why not, why not something else? And, and then thirdly, what did he mean by it? Okay, so that's where we're going this morning. Is that Okay. I, I, I need a little more. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, we're on the road. 
So question number one, why not Messiah? Next slide. Well, um, it's because of the firmly entrenched expectations people had. You know, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Remember that story? He feeds 5,000 people, and the people say, this is awesome, and they want to take him by force and make him king. They don't, they don't, they, they already have an idea. This is what we want the Messiah to be. You've just, you've just turned a couple of happy meals into 5,000, you know, meals for people. And so that awesome for you. So, so here's what we want you to do. We want you to be our kind of king, like kick the Romans out and establish another earthly kingdom here. That's very clear from the evidence. A physical earthly kingdom. Kick the Romans out, bring back the... The kingdom like under David and Solomon. Next slide. We've lost it somehow. Okay, next, I guess that is the next, next slide. Okay, next slide. So, yeah, why, okay, so, okay, so if, if Messiah isn't going to work, why Son of Man? Why not Batman? You know, or The Flash? Or The Tick? Anybody ever watch The Tick, that show? Yeah. You know? That was my favorite show. Uh, so, so, okay, why send a man, and why not something like this? Next slide. Well, because um, uh, it's like a trip to Home Depot. So I, I, I've been to Home Depot in California, in, in, in Washington State, in Colorado, and they're pretty much the same, right? And uh, like, I, I, also, I walk down every aisle, even though I don't need to walk down every aisle. And so I actually know, I actually know where the air compressors are. I don't, I've never wanted to buy one. I'm not ever going to buy one. But I know where they are, and I, and I can recognize them. And I go, like, to the plumbing section, which I don't, when I don't, I don't trust myself to do anything about plumbing. But I kind of know, know where different things about plumbing are. So if you think about it, the, for the New Testament, the Old Testament is kind of like a trip to Home Depot. There are all these ideas there that are, pre, that are pre-established, and people know about them but they might not know what they mean precisely and what they're all about. So, next slide. So what did Jesus, and then, so th- that's why, uh, so back up one, back up, yeah, uh, you know, why send him in? Because there is, there is evidence in the, in the Old Testament that he could work with. If he called himself Batman, he'd have to invent the whole backstory. But he could lead them through the Old Testament. It's like going through Home Depot with someone who works there. And can can explain to you not only can explain to you the the the, uh, the purpose of some of the things you know what they are and you know where they are, but maybe you don't fully understand how to put them together. So third question. So we're already we're already to the third question. This sermon is moving on quickly. So what it, so what did he mean by son of man? Next slide. Well, here's the background. Genesis 1, 27 and 31 is the, is the short passage where God creates human beings. And God says, we are made in his image, you and me, in the likeness of his image. And, uh, and so man, uh, uh, you know, to be human, Adam is to be human. All of us are made in God's image. Adam is to be in God's image. Now, if you think about it, Adam and Eve, when they sin, they're cast out of the garden. So the, the life we live is actually subhuman. It's less than God intended for humans to live. We live a kind of broken humanity. So Genesis 1 is about humanity as God intended to be right close to God, to be in perfect communication with God all the time before we foolishly walked away from that station. Now, Ezekiel, son of man, is just another way of saying human being. To be a son of or a daughter of in Hebrew is to be like the thing to which you're compared. So James and John are sons of thunder because they get angry really quickly, like a quickly forming storm over Galilee. So to be a son of man, son of uh, anthrop- anthropos, human, is to be human, truly human. So the way to think about this is Jesus condescends to live the life that God intended for us 
but we, we walked away from it. Does that make sense? So his human life isn't exactly like ours because we live broken human. His human life is ideally human, perfectly human, the way God intended for us. Psalm 8, 3 through 8. When I look at the heavens and moon and stars which you've established, uh, what is man that you care for him, the son of man, yet you have made us a little lower than yourself. So that's, that, that's the original of Psalm 8. So there the psalmist is saying, here's what God intended for us, to be like him, made in his image and uh, in relationship with him. And then Daniel 7. Um, Daniel, I think the way to think about Daniel 7 is, can you, can you, did you ever see the movie Jaws? You know the movie Jaws? Remember how it starts, you know? You know, and like you, and, and you know something's going to happen. I mean, just everything about it is danger, 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 right? That's how Daniel seven opens. Daniel seven opens with a vision of God's God's viewing the earth, and he's looking at the earth, and and he can it conjures a sea, and it, uh, the sea in the he, in the Hebrew symbol system is often uh, uh, implies chaos. That's why Jonah goes out over the sea. If there's a place maybe where God isn't in control, it maybe it's the sea. So number one, the sea, that symbolizes chaos. It's at night. You know, bad things happen at night. Freddy Krueger does not attack, you know, in the noon at the, you know, Safeway, uh, you know, under all the lights. You know, it's, it's, it's in the dark. You gotta be, afraid, you know, gotta be afraid of the dark. So sea, night, and then the sea is also agitated. And that, that's triple bad. Bad, bad, bad. I mean, if you're, if you're a Jew reading that, you know that's like, the, that this, is this, this is communicating, this is the most dangerous situation possible. And out of the sea come beasts. And beasts in that day, like ours, represent political power. Like, you know, it's the lion of the British Empire. You know, uh, and so it's the lion of Judah. And so the beasts run, come out of the sea. So the beasts are representing chaos because that's the, what the, the, the sea, the stirb sea at night represents. And they are told to arise and eat much flesh. And they chew up human beings and body parts go flying. Is that not what we have created collectively as human beings? We, we've created systems that dehumanize, you know, that, that go to war with each other. So the text then says that God in heaven is looking at the situation and says, I have had enough. And he takes power, glory and honor and power away from the beasts. See that they have they have that they have that power. You know, God at creation said to human beings, I'm trusting you with the earth. And we foolishly let evil in. We handed the keys over. <laughs> and so that ain't that ain't God's fault. That's our fault. We He trusted us and we let evil in. So you know, Satan, when Satan is in communication with Jesus and the temptations, you know, um, he says, all this power has been handed over to me. Yeah, it has been, by human beings. Now, it's not rightful. He's not exercising rightful authority, but he's got the kind of authority of somebody who's carjacked your car. <laughs> he's got the authority of having the keys. <laughs> and he's in, he's, in the, he's in the driver's seat. So... Um, so God says, I've had enough. And he takes glory and honor and power away from the beasts and gives it to one, this is what Daniel says, like a son of man. So Jesus fastens on that image, the one who's going to come and correct what got whacked out by our first parents. My grandpa used to use the word cattywampus to describe uh, things being whacked out. Um, 
And then Daniel 7 goes on to say that um, all peoples and nations, um, you know, will serve the Son of Man. And then at verse 27, that after the Son of Man reestablishes God's reign on earth, he's going to hand over the kingdom to the saints of the Most High. Now, um, Jesus, in Mark, you may remember, he, um, he tweaks that a little bit. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served. That's what, that's what Daniel 7 says. The Son of Man did not come, so he's calling himself that, did not come to be served, as is his right, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, where does he get that part? Well, Jesus combines Daniel 7 with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. No one had ever done that before. Even though those passages are there, but no one had, no one had put them together before in, in previous Jewish history. So um, you can see that he is, he is he's building out of the Old Testament, but he's building something that people didn't expect. They were looking for, hoping for, they just hadn't been thinking deeply enough about it, for a, for a king who would come and kick the Romans out and reestablish another earthly kingdom like, like their ancestors had had. But as the Son of Man, Jesus comes to bring God's kingdom to earth, but one that is a kingdom of, of human hearts. Not just of action, but of, of character and that we can actually grow into what God originally intended. That's a lot of theology. Are we okay so far? Everything's, everything's okay? Next slide. So I'm, I, I've got a series of slides here that are just are going to illustrate certain features of this. So in the, in the first, this is a really fascinating little interchange. In the first chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus and Nathaniel are, um, are uh, just talking, and Nathaniel is, uh, you know, he's pretty, he's the one that's really skeptical, right? N Nazareth, what can come from there? You know, like people from the Bay Area are thinking about Lodi or something like that, you know, like, what can, what can come from there? And so, um, Jesus says to Nathaniel that he saw Nathaniel under the fig tree and calls Nathaniel an Israelite, Ish-re-el. So, you may know that Hebrew was a written, ancient Hebrew was a written language without vowels. That meant when you were, when you, it gave you a lot of room to play with ideas. Think about even some of the Old Testament and people's names can mean this and that if you just change the vowels. And so Jesus says to Nathaniel, you're an Israelite, ish re -el, which is a reference to Jacob, the man who wrestles with God. So ish is the, is the word for male, for man in Hebrew, uh, in whom there is no guile. Next slide. But if you change one letter, which isn't even a letter in, in, the, in the written language, if you, go, if you say not Israel, but Ishroel, you would get the man who sees God. And so Jesus says, you believe because uh, I saw you under the fig tree, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So that's a reference back, right, to, the, to Jacob and his vision of the open heaven. So you can see how Jesus is, is using the language to help communicate something to Nathaniel. So, yep, you're the man who... You know, you're like that name, uh, the man who strives with God, but you will actually be the one who sees God. And I, the Son of Man, I'm the one who's going to open heaven. And you will see the angel of God, notice this, ascending and descending. If they're the angels of God, you'd think they'd be descending and 
ascending. But his point there is that you're going to, because of what I'm going to accomplish, you're going to be able to have constant communication with heaven. Nathaniel recognizes the reference, he recognizes the play on words, and the open heaven, the latter. Next slide. So, um, Jesus says, 3.13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who's come down from heaven, the Son of Man. So he, he refers to himself as the Son of Man and says, yeah, I'm, the one, I'm here, I'm the one who has come down from heaven. 5, 19 to 27, ends with God has given him, Jesus says this, him, referring to himself, the authority to judge because he is the son of man. So there's a clear reference, in G this is Jesus' words, he's clearly referencing Daniel 7. One like a son of man. Next slide. Unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Once again, using son of man to refer to himself. So, you know, there's a, there's a reference to sacrifice here. He knows what, what he's, he knows what his, what his fate is. He knows how he's going to accomplish the salvation of humankind. So it's sacrifice and also true life, right? Well, of course they've got life. They're breathing. They're respirating. But Jesus here is making the point, boy, just being, just, just existing is not like true life. What, what is it we are made for? We are made for God, but we have lost our way. And we are fascinated by things that do not matter. That are evanescent. And, and our culture and technology is making us even more addicted to things that are transitory. So just existing isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about true life. What are we human beings made for? We're made to be in connection with God, relationship with God, and that has become so difficult because there's so many other transitory things that, are cap that have captured our attention. Next slide. Jesus again. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am who I claim to be. So lift it up, be crucified. So he's aware, he's self-aware of, of the sacrificial element of his, of his mission. The, the crucifixion didn't come by accident. Jesus knew all along that the way to salvation is through um, his death and resurrection. And just after Judas had left, has left on the night of the betrayal of Jesus, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified. So glory... I mean, I, I don't know if we have a clear understanding of glory, even in the Bible. It's that shiny thing, you know, that is around, like the halo thing that's around some people. Well, glory, glory is more than that. It is, it is, I think you could say, it is understanding God's purpose and living it out in your life. <laughs> and Jesus understands that. So this is, gonna, this is glory that I suffer and die and be raised again. So this isn't accidental. Jesus knows it, and he goes and he embraces it. So now is the Son of Man glorified. Um, so glorify is not just through the crucifixion and resurrection. It has to do with, it has to do with um, understanding God's purpose and living it out. And for Jesus to do this, be crucified and resurrected, Something is going to change in our ability to relate to God. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So, so John the Baptist says of Jesus in John, I saw the spirit descend like a dove and it remained on him. And the word for remain, the verb is meno, which is, uh, there are at least 12 English terms that are used uh, variously to translate meno. So it is one of the most multivalent verbs in, in, in the Greek language in the Bible. Stay, abide, remain, endure. So 
Here's the deal. In the Old Testament, the Spirit comes on people occasionally and then leaves. Jesus is the one in whom the Spirit abides and remains, never leaves. Next slide. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man. And then just as Mo we saw this passage earlier, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So how is, how is it going to be accomplished that the sin of our first parents gets reversed and that we can actually live in connection with God the way God intended? It's if Jesus is crucified. 334. He's talking of himself. The one who God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Not a little bit, but all of it. Full. So Jesus is living the full life of what it means to be perfectly human and, and, and be connected to the Spirit. Next slide. So the, 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 the vision, the image of sight also is a, is a cardinal theme in John's gospel. The son can do nothing by himself, but can do only what he sees the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does. So, um, you know, Hebrew often expresses truth in functional language, whereas we're used to expressing the truth in, in sort of propositional language. Like we would say, um, God is... Um, you know, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, or they have the same will. Jesus, or, um, or that God is, God is all-powerful. All how, does, how does God describe himself in the Old Testament? He says, the word which goes forth from my mouth shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish the thing for which I purpose it. See, that's a functional way of expressing truth. I'm, God's the one who gets done whatever he sets out to do. Now, the Bible describes us this way. Human words fall to the ground. So I, was, I said to this church two weeks ago, I'm going to be there plenty of time. Didn't make it. <laughs> My words fell to the ground. I wasn't able to be there. It wasn't because I was lying about being there, trying to be there. But I'm not all-powerful. So, functional language. So, Jesus here says, I have perfect awareness of what God is doing in heaven. So, it's not like Jesus is living out some elaborate script that he and God cooked up before he was, you know, was, was, was birthed by Mary in Bethlehem. While he's alive, even while he's here interacting with human beings, he has perfect awareness of what God is doing in heaven. Next slide. Yeah, I can't do anything by myself. I, but as I hear, I judge. So uh, 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 my decisions are based on what I'm hearing from God. So authority to judge and connection to the Father. Next slide. Yeah, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up in the midst of the temple and cried in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. For as the scriptures say, out of his belly, out of his gut will flow rivers of living water. This he said about the Spirit, which had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what's this passage about? As a result of the crucifixion and resurrection, believers... It's now open to them that the Spirit of the living God doesn't just rest on them occasionally and then leave, but actually dwells within us. Amen. That is brand new. Not in the Old Testament, not after Genesis 3. And the glorification is the crucifixion resurrection. That is what turns the corner and makes it possible for the Spirit of the living God to dwell within believers. Next slide. So Ezekiel 36, um, this, is, <laughs> this is a passage where God is sort of like a, a disappointed dad. 
he says to the Israelites, you know what? I'm going to have to hallow my own name. Because the people living around you have drawn wrong conclusions about me. And it ain't their fault. They've looked to you. You're my people. They've looked to you to draw conclusions about me. And they've drawn wrong conclusions about me because you haven't been living according to my character. But who else are they supposed to look at? So it ain't their fault. So I'm going to have to hallow my own name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. To hallow is God's will to be understood and done. So you haven't lived on my will, so I'm going I'm to have to hallow my own name. And I'm going to take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. And I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. So this, Jesus sees this as what he's accomplishing. The giving of the Spirit and the possibility to live in accordance with God's will. Next slide. So, if I'm crucified and resurrected, that's going to make it possible for the Spirit to live in you. Not just me with you, but the Spirit of the living God actually in you. Next slide. Yeah, and up to now, you haven't been able to ask anything in my name. That's kind of a mind bender. But he says, you, can't, you couldn't have asked anything in my name because you don't know the Spirit in you. <laughs> but it's going to happen where the Spirit is going to come and live within you. And then it'll be possible. Next slide. So our existence, you know, disorder within. Is your, is your internal life disordered? You're human. <laughs> yeah. We have, we have crazy cacophony going on inside of us. And there's derang there are deranged relationships without. As son of man, Jesus is coming to bring God's kingdom and to repair the damage internally so that we can live in the will of the Father. So Augustine, beautiful language. He captured it this way. So in gustas domos anime me, narrow is the dwelling place of my heart, O God. <laughs> Your spirit dwells within me, but I've got that spirit stuck in a 364 square foot apartment. Um, Dilitate, the, the Latin is dilatator obste, like dilatory, be crazy expanded. Be like the houses that the Bay Area people buy up in the foothills, you know, 80,000 square feet. You know, they got a huge, help me to expand the place of my heart where your spirit dwells. Because I'm, so I'm so attached to things that don't matter to TV, to whatever plan I've got, or to my, or to my what, help, me to, help me to make more space for you, less space for the world. And that is possible because the Spirit lives within. That is repairing the original damage. So that's why the crucifixion resurrection is the, is the nodal point of history. It's a little like D-Day, I guess. After the Allies start to move in, the end is determined. Even before it, we actually reach it. So I, I have a friend who actually um, knows the uh, Curry family, Steph Curry. And um, yeah, Steph called me the other day, and, and uh, he wants to play me one-on-one -on -one in basketball next week. Okay, that's all not true. That's just a lie. But, I mean, let's say that were the case, and we were going to play a regulation game. I would say that before the game even starts, the end is determined. <laughs> right? That's where we are. The end is determined. The victory was won at the crucifixion and resurrection, and now God is in the process of unfolding the rest of that, the rest of the story until we get there. Let us be the people who focus on expanding our hearts and paying less attention to stuff 
and our world and more attention to the spirit that dwells within. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.